Just want to make a thumbnail real quick for you guys. We are going to get into this beautiful stack of new books here. Uh, but I did just want to kind of touch base on the current reads that we've kind of been discussing the last couple of weeks. Told you guys I finished The Web and the Rock by Thomas Wolfe. I think we might have finished something else. Can't remember. Uh, but we have been reading the Bible because we're going to be reading a John Steinbeck novel that focuses on sort of a, re a modern retelling of Genesis, or at least that's where the, you know, scholarship or the criticism has centered on its sort of foundational concept. So we did get through the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis is not really too long. It's quite tedious, but you can get through the book of Genesis rather quickly. Um, up next, we have Exodus. I'm not sure if I'm going to follow suit with the Old Testament or if I'm going to jump back to the New Testament. Uh, where we left off with Luke here, our good friend Luke. Uh, so I do want to kind of get through the Gospels and the New Testament, um, and then we'll kind of maybe go back to the Old Testament, or maybe vice versa. I'm not really quite sure, uh, but I do think the Bible is foundational, even if it seems really remote and kind of lofty uh, or whatever. You know, it's kind of hard to approach the Bible, but if you can sort of view the Bible as a wonderful gateway to a lot of other different types of literature, and stuff like that, poetry, metaphor, definitely teaches you how to think in symbolism and abstract thought. Uh, so that's, you know, our update on the Bible. So next, we still have my Confederate kinfolk. Still enjoying this book quite a bit, uh, but it's I haven't really blown through it as quickly as I originally anticipated. But we're about 150 pages into it, so we're definitely getting through it. It's really quite an interesting, fascinating account of black Americans, you know, kind of struggling uh, post-Civil War era and sort of this woman's, Thulani Davis's sort of attempts to, you know, figure out where she came from, what her roots are, all that good stuff. So I'll keep you guys up to date on my Confederate kinfolk. Uh, up next, we have Notes from the Underground by Dostoevsky. Um, and we, as you guys can see, we're getting pretty deep into Dostoevsky. Um, and this is kind of my first time in a long time approaching Dostoevsky again. So it's been really interesting. And we have read up to uh, page 62, uh, but I actually rewinded and started from the beginning again. So once we read everything that we've read so far again, we'll follow suit on page 62. But I do want to... Um, do some re, you know, kind of implement some rereading as I'm reading this uh, sort of essay or this book. Um, and we'll definitely be doing a, a probably a, a real, you know, interesting deep dive into notes from the underground and possibly the double if I end up really liking and resonating with the double. Um, so I don't want to ramble too much about Dostoevsky now until we're finished, but he's definitely on our radar. Um, up next, we have Lame Deer. And actually, these two books were actually originally planned for our summer reading list, remember? Uh, but we've actually bled into them and we're kind of dipping our toes and our fingers and our eyes into the summer reading list already. So we might end up adding a few more books to the summer reading list because I'm almost done with Lame Deer. And I don't think that Dostoevsky is going to take me too much time. Uh, but I am kind of reading it slowly, getting a lot of sleep cycles under my belt. Um, but we're... You know, on page 280 of Lame Deer, I've only got a couple more pages of the last chapter and then the epilogue. We'll definitely be doing a review slash analysis of this, uh, you know, sort of a, a in-depth, you know, talking about my thoughts and, and perceptions of this wonderful sort of memoir um, that was written by Richard Erdos, and it's about Lame Deer. He kind of dictated the story to Richard Erdos. Um, so anyway, let's get into the book haul. Some of these might, uh, may or may not be uh, repeats. I honestly don't remember, but I did get some new books. I wanted to talk about that and show you guys what we did get. It's a beautiful stack here. Maybe we'll just kind of start from top to bottom and work our way down. We got some really, really great stuff in here. Um, up first, we have The uh, Return of the King. Um, and I'm kind of kicking myself in the ass because I should have bought the Two Towers too. Because I've only got, uh, they're actually down here, but I've only got The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, or The Fellowship of the Ring. I don't have, for some reason I thought that I had The Two Towers, but I actually don't. So once I get The Two Towers, we'll kind of have, you know, a good chunk of the Tolkien universe under our belt. Um, I've read Tolkien in the past, um, never really read him deeply though, so that's something I do plan on doing. These are beautiful 
paperback editions. These ones are real nice, you know, came out around the time of the movies. And then this is like a smaller paperback edition of the movie version, which is really nice. Got that great picture of Aragorn on there. This is the third installment of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so we'll keep you guys up to date on this. Maybe towards like the winter or, you know, maybe um, fall, we'll try to start incorporating some Tolkien. So I do want to plan to do that. Uh, I found this really cool paperback copy of the Brothers Karamazov. I feel like I might have showed this to you guys, maybe on Instagram. I'm not sure if I put it in a video. But this is a great copy of Brothers Karamazov. The only problem is this edition smells like mothballs or like paint thinner or something. Just a real kind of off-putting smell about it. It's not terrible by any means. The book is in pretty damn good condition. Uh, but it does look like somebody dropped some kind of chemical on there or something. Uh, that's kind of just part and parcel of getting secondhand books, but it's in beautiful condition as you can see. I really love that sort of Russian wintry landscape that they got on here. Uh, so I'll keep you guys up to date on the Brothers Karmazov. Up next, we have this beautiful Oxford Classic Edition of a bunch of Christopher Marlowe. I think this is pretty much all of Christopher Marlowe. Has a Tamberlane Part 1 and Part 2, Dr. Faustus. The Jew of Malta and Edward II. Now we read Edward II in a different edition. Uh, it was in like a Shakespeare anthology, but I'm definitely looking forward to just immersing myself in the world of Christopher Marlowe. And no, that's not Christopher Marlowe. This is a self-portrait of Albert Durer, but it kind of looks like it could have been Christopher Marlowe. Uh, I'm not sure why they used somebody else's self-portrait for it, but um, very cool. You know, he's he writes poetic plays, sort of Elizabethan style plays. Uh, was a contemporary of Shakespeare, so looking forward to get into that. Don't remember if I showed this to you guys, but I got this beautiful old school edition of, uh, let's see here, uh, Leon Baptista Alberti's sort of treatise on painting. I think I might have touched upon this, don't remember. Uh, but this is going to be really cool. It's real short. That's a good thing about the Renaissance is they, that was kind of when the, uh, the genre of art criticism and art interpretational analysis was kind of begun with people like Giorgio Vasari and Alberti and you know Godolfi and all those guys uh, so super cool up next we have a, a woman author Edith Wharton if we have any Edith Wharton uh, fans out there please let me know I do plan to do a video eventually of books to recommend to women um, you know feminine kind of books lately I've been mostly reading male authors so I do want to branch out at some point and get some female authors under my belt maybe we'll actually throw something like this on our summer reading list just so we can kind of start curating that uh, up next we have this great book oh, I don't know if it's great it sure looks great it's called Shakespeare Plain by William Leary it's a Shakespeare analysis, talks about how to interpret Shakespeare, how to understand Shakespeare in the context of culture and history. I don't think it's like postmodern Marxism, which is good. Um, it looks pretty old. When was this written? 1977. So this uh, definitely is going, you know, almost 40 years back, but this seems really great. Um, sort of talks about how to interpret, interpret the culture of what Shakespeare's plays would have been like. I see some annotations in here pretty cool uh, so we'll keep you guys up to date on that still got a bunch of Shakespeare material we got to get through too um, not only Shakespeare himself but Shakespeare biographies and Shakespeare analysis uh, up next we got this book about Quanta Parker and the Comanches this is going to be a great supplementation to kind of some of the Native American stuff that's always on our peripheral uh, just a genre and a period in history that I'm real interested in Quanta Parker pretty interesting Native American figure um, and this is a great edition by S.C. Gwen. Uh, so that's something else we need to incorporate is more uh, historical books, non-novels. Non uh, we do have um, a Thomas Sowell cultural history book up for the summer reading list. Uh, so as far as the Native American stuff, we're still getting through it, but we will be keeping you guys up to date. Uh, up next, we have this beautiful, interesting um, Penguin edition of uh, Titanic first-hand accounts. So I'm definitely looking forward to getting into this, um, sort of supplementing my obsession with the Titanic movie and all that with some actual historical, you know, uh, memoirs or history, whatever. So it's got a beautiful sort of thing, a whole picture of the ship on there. It's just gorgeous, as well as this side. Just super fantastic. This is kind of first-hand accounts. First-hand accounts of Titanic are very, very interesting. 
Um, it's hard to tell how true they are because things were obviously um, sensationalized and people had a lot of post-traumatic stress. So who knows exactly uh, what people remember or how accurately they remember. Uh, up next, we have this beautiful James Joyce anthology. I'm so happy to have some James Joyce in my collection. Um, uh, he was kind of introduced to me from other YouTubers and other novelists. Um, I really hope this is not abridged, but I don't think it is. Sometimes you have to be careful with anthologies because they can kind of be, they shorten things up a little bit. Uh, but James Joyce, not too familiar with him. I guess he's like an Irish writer or maybe English. Um, big influence on people like Jack Kerouac, the Beatniks, um, stuff like that. Uh, so we're definitely looking forward to getting into James Joyce. Apparently he's real funny um, and he's real, his, his content is pretty emotionally heavy. Um, and it's very, very difficult to decipher. It's almost like he's talking in another language or something. Or so I've read and heard. I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, last but not least, we have this really beautiful edition of War and Peace. This is the Richard Piavar and Larissa Volkonsky translation um, that is different than our translation up here, actually. You know, I've got the Penguin Deluxe Edition. But I was in, I was inquired to get the, or I was intrigued rather to get this because this is the original version that contained French. Uh, Tolstoy originally wrote War and Peace, featuring Russian and French before it was translated into English, obviously, and it smells great too. Beautiful print, real small print. Um, the reason for that was that the aristocracy, or aristocracy, and sort of the elite community of the Russian czars and the Russian monarchy back then spoke a lot of French because I guess they were doing a lot of diplomacy, a lot of trading, and had a lot of relationships with France. So there was a lot of French and Russian. Um, now the problem with this edition is that there's probably maybe 25 percent, 30 percent French, which I don't read. So. You know, it's kind of like when you're reading Shakespeare, I'm going to have to kind of be ripped out of the narrative and kind of refer down to the translations at the bottom of the page if they have those. Um, but if we have any French speaking people out there or Russian, uh, let me know what edition of War and Peace you prefer, because this is sort of the original vision that um, Tolstoy had. But I prefer the or at least I think I prefer the version that just has English. It's easier for me to understand. And it's like uh, Benjamin McVoy was talking about the original version, uh, you know, that features French and Russian. It sort of rips you out of the story and then you kind of have to get back in because you're trying to decipher what is French. Um, but it would be an interesting introduction to French, perhaps. I probably wouldn't understand the majority of what they were saying. Uh, but it might be cool just to kind of get familiar with what French looks like, what it might sound like, and what is the French context of War and Peace. That would be very interesting. Because not when you read modern English translations of Tolstoy, um, you're not only getting a translation of Russian, obviously, as Tolstoy's native language, but you're also getting a translation from French. So you could probably figure out a lot more of Tolstoy's original vision uh, for war and peace by understanding French and obviously Russian, but that would be very difficult to try to approach another language. But I would be interested to know if there's a way that you can kind of understand or at least skim other languages and books even without being 100% fluent. So that is our book update. Got to clean up all these books. Make sure you guys subscribe. Please share this video. Follow me on Instagram at Andrew Marlowe Artist Official, and we will talk to everybody very soon.